Coming up on this episode, I'm joined by Liev and Dimani for our NBA Player Awards preview. Always a great chat with Lee, and I'm sure you guys will particularly enjoy it if you like to invest your money into futures markets like these, although, as always, gamble responsibly. Enjoy. Welcome, Lee. How have you been, mate? Is there a little bit of a a void in your life at the moment? We're in this period now where the Essendon Bombers have finished their season, so you don't get to watch them play every week. And, of course, I'm sure you're waiting for the NBA season to kick off again to uh, watch your Miami Heat hopefully go one step further this season. Bit of a void at the moment. I've tried to fill it up with NFL, but just I just can't seem to get into NFL like the rest of the diehard American fans are. Uh, but footy finals are here. I did watch last night's game. Something about this Giants team, I don't know, it's just easily lovable. Uh, the Blues resurgence. Uh, any fear at all for Friday night? You probably couldn't. You probably were hoping to come up against Port Adelaide as opposed to GWS last mm-hmm. night. Yeah, yeah, plenty of fear. I mean, I lived through the 2019 prelim where we were a dollar twenty favourites to win that game. Like you couldn't be any shorter for a preliminary final than what we were against the Giants at the G in 2019. And now we come up against them again in basically the same scenario, albeit that was a Saturday twilight game. This will be a Friday night game. And they're probably, along with Carlton, the, the two most informed teams in the league. So... If you meet a Collingwood fan that thinks we're an absolute lock to win on Friday night and we're a guarantee to play in the granny, then they are delusional and irrational because this is probably bound to be a close game and I am very, very nervous. I was incredibly nervous going into the Melbourne qualifying final game just because I knew what that meant for for both teams and now we've seen Melbourne uh, eliminated in straight sets. But uh, yeah, I'll be... It'll be hard for me to sit down and not move for the entire game on uh, on Friday night because, yeah, last Thursday night it was, I was, yeah, couldn't sit still at all, was up watching the game. Uh, yeah, it was a struggle. But uh, anyway, we'll get on to the NBA. We're going to go through the individual player awards here. We'll start with Rookie of the Year, which I think outside of MVP might be the most intriguing one. You've got Wemby, the favourite at 250, Chet Holmgren is at 375, Scoot Henderson is 450. They're the top three in the market, according to Sportsbet. So I'm going with my two favorites here and then uh, a little smoky as well. Well, I'll let you go first, though, because I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I've got a 3 2 1 uh, structure, I guess, and unfortunately, I've gone quite safe. Scoot Henderson, I've got a 3. Um, I saw a report this morning that the Lillard talks have halted and I, I burst out laughing. I thought this is just a... I know a Portland Trailblazers member is just playing to this story to try and drive the place up. I am with full confidence that uh, Dame Lillard will not be a Portland Trailblazer. And obviously that means the keys to Scoot Henderson. Didn't really get to see much of him in summer league. I think it was only 20 minutes in the end. But he is so much of what his game style explosion. He'll be on every highlight reel every night. Yeah, there'll be some poster attempt or something like that that will freak you out and that, I'm sure voters will love that. He put up huge numbers. They won't I think you and I both had the bottom of the West, so they literally won't win any games, but he put up huge stats and sometimes they can get you across the line. Chet uh, at a bare minimum will be one of the best rim protectors in the NBA, I think. Um we got to see we've seen the flashes of the offensive sides, but I think just alone the defensive side and of course you know how much I love Thunder's development and the rise of SGA and Giddy. He just he's almost perfect for for that team. But Wemby, I mean, those two games that we watched, I think we got to see the best and worst of Wemby this season. I think one night he'll have a seven point game, maybe five foul out or whatever. The next night he'll have twenty to thirty points and three four plays that we've never seen before. He is the most the highest like touted prospect in a while. So every game we'll be watching, we just see so much of him, and I think. Um, yeah, his cachet alone, his play style, his excitement will bring him probably rookie of the year, in my opinion. Because uh, and mostly because yeah, he'll he'll have a lot of the credit. I mean, shots will be taken from Chet by SGA, by Giddy. He won't have the ball as much. Scoot, the losses might hurt him, but when he's in that good middle ground, I think where I don't know, they may sort of beat the odd team every now and then, but he'll also get a lot of the credit. So um, I'm keen to hear the smoky of yours. So if that wasn't uh, your top three. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I, I'm i going away from Wemby here. So I think $2.10 is horrific value, and I personally don't think he'll win it. The thing I'm worried about, I guess, backing against him is the fact that if he's in any way half decent, he'll just have that much hype, and the media narrative will push Rookie of the Year his way, right? There's just there's so much hype about him, him as a prospect, as you spoke about. He just needs to be good. Really, like if there's an argument between him and Scoot or him and Chet or the three of them, Wemby will probably win it because of the hype factor that comes with him. However, my biggest question mark here is with the NBA bringing in the new rules of having to play 65 games to be eligible for these awards, how much faith have you got in Chet and Wemby playing 65 games? Because I don't, I don't particularly have much faith. I don't have much faith in that happening. They're both skinny, seven foot plus players. They're both on, like the Spurs aren't going to push Wemby out there if he's a little bit sore. Like they are going to take no risks with him whatsoever in his first couple of seasons. I think the same can be said for Chet. I think the Thunder have a pretty good team right now where Chet's almost the the topping on kind of the cake. Like he's not someone they necessarily, like he's going to be an added bonus, that's for sure. But I don't think he's necessarily going to be a full part of their team absolutely straight away. Like obviously he'll start and he'll be an impactful player. There's no doubt about that. But we saw them be a play-in tournament team without him last season. And so again, with him and his frame, he's just missed a, his first full year, didn't play at all. Is he going to play 65 games? I just don't think so. And therefore, I have Scoot Henderson as my favorite by default almost. And I do think there's a way that he can win this outside of the 65 game barrier. I mean, yes, he'll have to, you know, let's assume that Dane gets traded, which I think he will at some point anyway early in the season. I think the issue is he still he still have to share the ball with Anthony Simons, with Shaden Sharp, with Jeremy Grant, who's obviously still there. But I do think the powers that be in Portland will acknowledge that, hey, this guy is the numero uno. He is our future. And I think they'll be pushing Chauncey Billups to put the ball in his hands as much as possible. He seems you know, just as ready to go in terms of impact as Chet and Wemby do. And so for me, I have him on top at 450, particularly value-wise. Like I'm saying he'll win it, but I think particularly value-wise, given he's the third favorite, he's definitely the player that I would be betting on, that is for sure. I do have Chet second uh, in saying that. You said that, you know, he'll have Shea and Giddy, you know, taking shots off shots off him. I actually think it might go the other way where he might get better looks than, say, Wemby does playing alongside Shea and Giddy. And that's, I guess, going to be the question mark for Wemby in his uh, rookie season is he's this seven foot five, you know, freak. We expect him to probably have a pretty good, you know, field goal percentage. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. I think you're going to see a lot of ill-advised shot attempts from Wemby. You're probably going to see more three-point attempts than what you probably um, like to see. So. I think Chet's probably going to get better looks just because he is playing alongside, you know, one of the best, if not the best, young uh, backcourt in the league in Shea Gildish Alexander and Josh Giddy. Yes, he didn't play at all in his rookie season, but the fact that he's been in the NBA system for a full year has to be some kind of advantage, I think, over Wemby, over Scoot and all these other 2023 um, rookies. So I've got him second, obviously, at 375, as I said. And the third one, my smoky. Look, he's not going to win it. I just think he's way over the odds. And that's Bilal Koulibaly. He's at $101 on a rebuilding (laughs) Wizards team. I think he could be starting by the end of the season. Or at the very least, he's going to average 20-plus minutes off the bench. And I look at some of the guys that are above him in terms of, like, shorter than him in, um, in the market. And... There are guys in the market who might play 10 minutes a game, max kind of thing. Like, I just think him at $101 for a guy who's maybe going to start half the games, potentially. I I could see him, like, he'll probably start coming off the bench to begin with, but I think halfway through the season, especially if the Wizards are doing absolutely nothing, like, might as well put him out there as your starting three or your starting four play him 25, 30 minutes. And if the guy's going to get that much volume of playing time, then $101 seems way, way over the odds. 
So I'm just I'm just putting it out there. I'm not saying he's going to win it. I just think he is no way he should be 101. dollars Any anyway, any um, comments on on that? No, the 65 game thing is a fantastic point, and uh, yeah, I think this is this is definitely more my how I would see the season playing out as opposed to what might actually happen. Um, the in terms of the shot selections uh, for Chet and uh, Dar, I do like it. I do trust probably um, Chet's shot more because I think you and I both agree. Victor, he's just got a, he's got a nice shooting stroke, but that doesn't actually mean that he's a great shooter. And I think his numbers were closer to like late twenties, like thirty percent tops. I think it was percentage wise. So I'm probably more confident um, in Chet's body holding up. It doesn't really say all that much to, to be honest. Out of those two, so. Um, but if, I mean, if they're the, they're both in, they're going to be compared to one another. They're both these slender, um, outside shooting, shot blocking big men, and um, maybe hopefully it's the start of uh, some sort of rivalry between them. It's going to be very interesting to see. Alrighty, six man of the year here. Odds thanks to sports bet. The favourite uh, to go back to back here is Malcolm Brogdon at eight fifty. Uh, very competitive market. Emmanuel Quickly and Norman Powell both at nine dollars, ten dollars for Buddy Hield, Malik Monk eighteen dollars for Bobby Portis, uh, your Heat man Caleb Martin, and Chris Paul as well. Early thoughts for you on six man of the year. Gabe Vincent was the one that I uh, had as my little smoky out of nowhere there because I, I, I can't believe that the Lakers got him for so cheap uh, on there. And I was pretty filthy that we lost him. Um, on there, but he's going to have I think a lot of opportunity. He's going to be that spark by the player. I think his play style, um, getting to the cup and the outside shot there, the big games. I'm sure that he'll he'll um, start. But I think he's the type of guy that LeBron likes playing with. Uh, on there, he'll get a lot of open shots. Uh, and I haven't actually checked the odds of what he is, but he's going to be oh, he's going to get a lot of exposure uh, on there. The Lakers uh, hopefully are going to be winning <laughs> games and. Uh, should they make a postseason run? I feel like he'll feature pretty heavily, being a bit of a veteran guy, and he's been in a few battles there. So, Edmondson to my Smokey, uh, and there. So, quickly Bogdan, and then uh, Gabe Vincent to my little value, if there is any. Yeah, so Gabe Vincent's paying $36, so a little bit of value there. The first thing I want to say before I get into my trio here, if you are thinking about betting on Malcolm Brogdon at $8.50 to go back-to-back for six man of the year, just go and donate it to charity, please. Just go and do something better with that money because if there's one thing I can guarantee, it is that Malcolm Brogdon, I'm put it, take it to the bank right now, Malcolm Brogdon is not winning six man of the year again. He's not. And this is coming from a guy who I was very happy that he won six man of the year last season. He was fully deserving of the award. He's not winning it again. He's the injury history for Malcolm Brogdon. Are we really going to get two like full seasons out of him in a row here? Again, is he going to play 65 games? I don't think so. This is a player who the Celtics wanted to trade in the offseason for Kristaps Porzingis. They were going to trade him in that three-way deal to the LA Clippers, and the LA Clippers took one look at Malcolm Brogdon's medical history uh, and current um, medical status, I suppose, and said, no, thank you. We are vetoing this trade. We are not going ahead with this. Forced the Celtics to get, end up giving up Marcus Smart to the Grizzlies to acquire Porzingis. And Malcolm, I did read something on social media. I don't know if it was true or not, uh, but I did read something about Malcolm Brogdon being not overly happy with the Celtics organization, which why would he? They tried to trade him. Like after two months after he was announced sixth man of the year, the Celtics tried to trade him. So I I just think he's no chance of winning six man of the year. Uh, I also have quickly as my favorite at nine dollars. Uh, he what well, I think he finished second last season behind Brogdon. It was basically a two horse race. He's a young player. He should still be on the improve, and he's also in a contract year, which has got to be incredibly motivating. He's he's sure. on on the final year of a four year ten million dollar contract. This is a player that if he has a really good year, if he wins six man of the year, I think would be looking at upwards of twenty million per season. So he's going to be incredibly motivated to play well, not just to help out the Knicks and their aspirations to uh, to get into the playoffs again and you know hopefully win one or two playoff series, but also most importantly, well, not most importantly, but uh, certainly from an individual perspective, he'll be looking to play well to try and get a big deal from the Knicks or uh, elsewhere if there's not an extension forthcoming before his free agency uh, hits. Second, I've got Chris Paul. Now, I've said a lot about the 65-game 
mark, and I'm not particularly sure that Chris Paul is going to get to 65 games. However, for his caliber of player, I think $18 is fair value, and I think he should be one of the favorites here. He was an all-NBA player like only two seasons ago. I feel like this idea, and look, this might be some warrior bias coming in here a little bit. I think the idea that he's completely fallen off a cliff and he's washed up is a bit off the mark. Like He averaged 14 points and like nine assists last season. That's pretty good numbers. Shot 37.5% from three-point range, which I think was his best for the last seven or eight years. So the idea that Chris Paul is completely washed, I know it's just because we get to the playoffs every season and he gets injured, right? That's the only, like regular season wise, he's been a really good player. Uh, He was a really good player last season. He knew he was an all NBA player the season before that. So I just think $18 is a little bit uh, overs. Now, again, will he play 65 games? That's probably the big question mark. I do think that he should be like, unless he picks up like major injuries here, he probably should be able to get to that point because I think, you know, being the backup point guard in Golden State, I'd imagine that he will probably only play 23 to 25, 26 minutes per game. So he should really be getting his rest as such uh, within games rather than necessarily having to miss too many games. Obviously, we've got the resting policy that's come in with the NBA as well. We'll probably talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, But Chris Paul is actually exempt from... um, uh, exempt from that in a way because he he and Steph Curry or any player that's over 35 who's classified as a star player uh, can rest on one night of back of a back to back given their age I suppose anyway uh, my Smokey here and I'm half taking the piss here half being serious Ben Simmons seventy six dollars any 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 chance here I actually I should. I should I should maybe save him for the next one most improved because he's starting at such a low base. Who knows? Uh, I don't know. I just is there a world? Is there a world in which he's actually a half decent player for the Nets off the bench next? And like the ideal thing if you're betting on Ben Simmons here for six man of the year is that you say to yourself, well, maybe he starts the year off the bench, plays the first. 45, 50 games as a bench player and plays that well that he actually gets into the starting lineup and plays twenty the last 25, 30 games as a starter because therefore he'd still be eligible for six man of the year. Uh, I don't know. I just wanted to bring his name up more than anything, really. <laughs> We've been talking about it a lot. And a lot of these awards, I think, the last couple of years. Best player of the year. We all see some videos where I've, I saw, I watched the Mikel Bridges on Paul George's the podcast, he says I'm 100% ready to go, but uh, Ben Simmons, unfortunately, I'm not going to uh, put any sort of confidence in him, in him being a six man. But it's, it's again, infuriating because with Mikel Bridges, Cam Johnson, he's perfect for his team. Claxton, if you pay him on those forward spots, he would be so good for this team. But yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. I reckon we see Alrighty, most improved player, perhaps the biggest joke of any of these awards because uh, according to Sportsbet, we've got Macau Bridges, the favourite at $8, but Kate Cunningham is at $13. I just, you and I are both the same. Why are these high picks, these top three, top five picks in the market for most improved player? They just should be exempt from it. They should be excluded. Like Kate Cunningham coming off basically missed the whole season, all but, what did he play, like 10 games last season, coming into his third year, was the first overall pick. Of course he will improve. Of course he will. Like, I just, but he should be excluded from this. It's ridiculous. Uh, anyway, Austin Reeves is at $14. I'm happy if he, I'm happy for him to win it. Maxi, yeah, maybe two. Scotty Barnes, again, top five pick. Doesn't deserve to be in calculations. Alperen Schengen's at 17, Anthony Simons, Evan Mobley, Franz Wagner, Jalen Williams, Jordan Poole, Obi Toppin, all $23. What are your thoughts? I've doubled down on uh, my man Scotty Barnes at number two. <laughs> <laughs> I proclaimed him the next uh, Giannis when he came out of the draft, and uh, he, I think he laughed at me when, I, when a lot of people laughed at me about that. But new, I'm going to go new coach uh, over in, in, in um, Toronto, so... Uh, hopefully that's a new fresh face, and he comes from uh, this. I think he comes from OKC. So I think uh, me, me, me and the coaching tree of OKC. I think anyone that um, takes over team does really well with there. 
it's gonna it's gonna be a frustrating year for Dennis Schroeder as your point guard there, but hopefully that just more. Hey, 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 FIBA World Cup MVP, oh, sorry, you settle uh, down a little bit, jeez. He's the best player. In the, he's the best player in the world, um, <laughs> according to FIBA standards. So I'll take that back there. But yeah, I have got Mikel Bridges as the as the my favourite there, just because you yeah, know what he did in such a short amount of space, more reps, more time. Him as a character, I think he's probably one of the most liked blokes in the NBA. I'm starting to realise the way people talk about him and how, yeah, more so him off the court as well. So the most improved is one of the hardest things to predict. Uh, otherwise, it's always some random person out of nowhere. So this one, I will put these three maybe because they were just safety, but who knows? Someone left the centre will end up winning it probably. Um, you said that you've got a funny one or, or half serious, half. No, I'm bit. being I'm being dead serious. I just know you're going to find it incredibly funny, and so <laughs> you're you're exactly right. Like trying to pick most improved is yeah, good luck, good luck. Like no one would have picked Laurie Markkinen last season, really. Like no one came out of nowhere, got traded from the Cavs to the Jazz, uh, and I'm going to follow a similar path here. So I read an article the other day, very interesting. Could John Collins follow the same path as Laurie Markkinen? So I am my smoky here is John Collins at one hundred and one dollars for most improved oh player, God. and I know what you think of John Collins, no, and I and I think and I think maybe maybe other people aren't as uh, down on John Collins as you are. But I do think that the the league perception of John Collins is fairly low at the moment, particularly with he had that like finger injury last season or whatever, which meant he just forgot how to shoot. Like right. his three point percentage went from like above league, league average, like close to forty percent, to like thirty percent. Like just could not. I watched him play against the Warriors a couple of times. He just could like could not shoot. It was real odd. Um, but I know listening and reading some reports and stuff like that, that he had a finger injury. I'm not sure if he's over that or not at this point, but $101 goes from Atlanta to a Utah team who, yes, they've got Laurie Market and like he'll obviously have, um, you know, a lot of shooting volume and, and get a lot of plays run for him next season or this season and whatnot. But I do think that there is space there for John Collins to come in and play a much bigger role than what we saw in Atlanta, where he was really just like a catch-and-shoot guy or a lob threat kind of thing. You know, they certainly weren't running their offense through John Collins, that's for sure. And I just, I, I like the idea of a collins front frontcourt with Walker Kessler. Like, that's a, that's a big front court. I think Collins, like, defensive deficiencies, you can kind of, with Kessler next to him at the five, I think you can probably hide those a little bit more. Is that is that how like the Jazz are going to run? Are we going to see Markin at the three, Collins at the four, Kessler at the five? Is that is that what we're going to see here? I I actually don't know, uh, but it'll be interesting to see. I just you know, one hundred and one dollars. We saw what just happened with Laurie Markinen. He's got the talent, and I don't think he can dispute that. He's got the talent, and he had a bad enough year last season that I think he could take a major leap here, put up much bigger numbers than what he did with Atlanta the last couple of seasons. And so in a market where I just like, Macau Bridges deserves to be the favorite, I suppose, but you're just not going to bet on that at $8 in such a wide open market where it's so hard to predict. And so again, if you're going to have a bet on it, why not take the value? Why not go for someone completely left the field? And I think John Collins has the talent and he's still a proven enough player in the past to be able to potentially go close to to winning this award or, or being in the conversation. But I'll let you respond because I know you're a certified John Collins hater. Yeah, very rarely do I yeah, just hate on a player like this. But John Collins, to me, I see it going completely the other way. I see him getting incredibly exposed in Atlanta. For the simple from, sorry, from Atlanta to the Jazz because he had Trey Young, who's one of the most prolific playmakers in the NBA. He was a lob threat. He was catch and shoot. There's no proven playmaker at the Utah Jazz. Laurie Markman has a back to basket game. I've seen him with a face-up game. He can create his own shot. People like John Clark can create their own shot. People like John Collins, to me, are way too reliant on an elite playmaker, and I see it going the other way. I see him plateauing, if anything, and not being able to um, 
essentially to thrive. Like the, the ta- he's exciting, I'm sure. That, no, like dunks are cool and everything like that. But I see him not. I don't, I'm not confident in him starting, and I see him as a sixth man role to be more of a bit of excitement or just throw something like something different. If Laurie Markman's having an off night or something, I, yeah, I'm not going to hold my breath for John Collins. Yeah, you're probably right, and you know you're probably gonna we'll listen back to this in ten months' time, and everyone will think I was taking the absolute piss. But I just read that article, and I thought maybe there's a realm of possibility there that is more than what a hundred and one dollar odds would suggest. Defensive Player of the Year, Jaron Jackson Jr. is favorite with Sportsbet to go back to back at six dollars. Evan Mobley is at seven. Giannis Santa de Cumpo is eight fifty. Anthony Davis and your man Bam Adebayo at ten. Go Bear thirteen. Draymond Green at fourteen. Lopez and Embiid and Claxton at nineteen, along with Walker Kessler. Uh, early thoughts on this one. This award is starting to just discredit almost in a way. Every year, I feel like I see the defensive player of the year. Absolutely, in there. Uh, especially come playoff time, maybe it's a little bit easier to gain for them than what you've actually got. Um, a few weeks to actually put some time into somebody there. So I've gone probably a little bit, I don't know whether that fatigue's going to kick in or something, but I've gone Go Bear at three, just because I feel like he's always in any conversation. He's actually going to have a bit more time with the Timberwolves. So I'm actually set up their defensive scheme to actually use his strength. My man Bam, I feel like one of these years where he's finally going to break out and actually give him the defensive player because he's just going to be in a lot of conversations there. But I've gone Evan Mobley as number one as defensive player of the year because the Cavs, I think you and I both agreed this is they're gonna this is the year they have to choose between Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. And Evan Mobley's just way more we're just gonna his future compared to Jared Allen is way better. And I think they're gonna play Evan Mobley a lot more and geez, in fact if Evan Mobley's there halfway through the year, like especially if the Cavs season is gone as great as they would Want it to be done with Mitchell trade rumors, but it's starting to circulate. Yeah, I see Jared Allen being shipped out of there. We'll try to strengthen up that three position or a bit more depth than ever Mobley because he is a really, really, really talented young player. A bit more responsibility on his end. He can, I've seen him switch out to the perimeter, I've seen him switch um, onto wings and even some cards. So I'm going to go bear, bam, and then Mobley is my favorite. Is that are there any, how, is your order similar at all? Do you have similar reasoning? Yeah, so we've both got Bam at two, which I uh, yes, I agree with your opinions there. One of the most versatile defenders in the league. Miami should be a um, you know top team in the East again, specifically if they get Dame. And I just think if they get Dame, maybe that actually takes less. Um, maybe sorry, maybe that takes uh, more of the workload off Bam offensively. And therefore, he can really, really double down on what he does on the defensive end of the floor. Because I do think that, you know, at, at this present time, him being kind of the second offensive guy, I guess you've got Tyler Hero as well there. But, you know, the two, three kind of um, offensive options there in Hero and Bam, I do think that there is an increased, you know, offensive need for Bam in the Miami system that maybe does take away a little bit from what he could do on the defensive end of the floor. And I just think if you put another star offensive player in Dame uh, into that system, I do think maybe it allows Bam to be a little bit, um, you know, prioritize the defensive end of the floor a little bit more. Uh, I do have Giannis as my favorite here at 850. I just think that he's going to be incredibly motivated by what happened at the end of last season, by the Milwaukee Bucks getting eliminated in the first round of the playoffs to your Miami Heat. I just think he's going to be really pushing hard to kind of reestablish himself here. I think I think most people probably now have Jokic as the best player in the league. And if I was Giannis, I'd, I'd find that a little bit disrespectful. I think, you know, he winning, you know, back-to-back MVPs. Yes, it was a few years ago now. What he did in 2021 in the finals, what he's done during the regular season throughout the last five or six years. He is still, he's still to me the second best player in the NBA. And I think he'll want to try and reestablish and push the number one mantle away from Joker again. So I think he's going to be incredibly motivated. I think uh, that could show up on the defensive end of the floor because you look at it and you think if you're going to evaluate who the better player is out of Giannis Antetokounmpo and Nikola Jokic, then the 
the only argument I think Giannis really has is the defensive side of the ball. I think everyone can probably identify and evaluate now that Nikola Jokic is a more skilled and better offensive player than Giannis. And I'm not sure it's really an argument. However, I don't think you can... No one's going to argue that Jokic is a better defender than Giannis. And so if Giannis can try and really um, showcase that, then I think he's a chance to win Depoy. And I think that might push his conversation uh, in MVP as well, which we'll talk about in a second. So that's who I had at the top of my list. Bam, second. And the third one I had that I just wanted to put out there if you can get $76 for a guy who won Depoy two seasons ago, I think that's pretty good value. Marcus Smart is $76. I don't think he'll win it. I don't think he'll ever win Depoy again. But one of the best perimeter defenders in the league, obviously going to uh, the Memphis Grizzlies, they're going to be without Ja Morant for the first 25 games of the season. I think with the kind of lineups that they'll be um, running, I suppose, in the uh, first 25 games without Jar, they're going to be really prioritizing the defensive end of the floor. Obviously, they've got Jaron Jackson Jr. there. Maybe having both him and Smart kind of, uh, you know, puts puts a line through both of them potentially for Defensive Player of the Year. But I do think that here that, uh, that Marcus Smart at $76, again, just a little bit, uh, over the odds, in my opinion, a little bit of a smoky there again. I don't think he's going to win it, but for the value, he'd uh, definitely be my pick uh, for anyone that's you know more than twenty bucks basically in this market. MVP here, Nikola Jokic is the favorite at five dollars. Uh, Giannis is at six dollars. Luca is at seven. Embiid is at eight. Tatum eight fifty. KD and Steph fourteen dollars. Booker is at fifteen dollars. Shea Gildas Alexander, the only other player under twenties, at seventeen. Thoughts from you? Embiid's reputation took a massive hit. I think, like last year, I cannot imagine him going back to back because once he got bounced out of the playoffs, people kind of squinted at like previous playoffs and realized the best team he's ever beaten is like a Raptors team who we couldn't name their starting five. So uh, he could win I, most improved based on how bad he was in the playoffs. Yeah, well, <laughs> the base is on there. So yeah, they're going to be really stiff on him this year. I feel like he's, yeah, he has one bad game. It's uh, social media being the place you want to be. Uh, I've gone a, I guess, a smoky, if you want to call it that. I am so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, talk about OKC for this entire season. I see them having a potentially what, what the Kings did last year. in Because ter- there's always one team every year in each conference that just shoots to the top. Very fun, very exciting, and um, really banking on uh, this Chet Giddy uh, SGA trio. Uh, SGA, incredibly clutch. One of the top scorers in the NBA, cool dude, and uh, he's turning definitely into the leader of that team. So I've got him at number three. Luca for the th- probably fourth year in a row, you and I have just talked about him potentially being uh, MVP. You'd think the team, again, they they made shrewd moves, I think, as a term that uh, you and I said. Uh, their their roster is not going to contend, but they'll still be up there just because of Luca's brilliance. Uh, he, Lukari, another year, a bit more time with him. They'll still make more and more moves, I think. And, uh, yeah, just his greatness alone, always having him MVP-type numbers and uh, the fact that he's been in conversations, mate, who knows, maybe this might either breaks out. But Jason Tatum is uh, my favourite this year. I think Boston have one of the most talented rosters and uh, we'll probably have to call him soon, a young veteran in the league. He's been around for a long time and uh, he's, figuring, he's figured out a lot of things. He's grown in so many different aspects of his game. Jalen Brown, uh, we'll, almost, we'll call it almost a prove-it year. And uh, you feel like after a while they've had uh, so many losses and so many falling short that uh, this is the year. So they'll always be at the top of the standings. That's just how it is. And uh, I think this is the year that Tatum takes it, uh, if not Luca. Did you have did you have an outside smoky that uh, you just thought might be worth bringing up for MVP? Uh, I do. I do, but I'll I'll leave that till last. So my my favorite is Luca at sevens. This has to be the year. Is this now the third year in a row? Well, I think the last two years he's entered as favorite or as one of the top three favorites, and this has to be the year, doesn't it? Sure. At seven dollars, he looks he looks really he looks really fit at the moment. He obviously continued playing through the off season, playing for Slovenia, played really well in the World Cup. I mean, he had some poorer moments, I suppose, towards the end of their 
elimination, had a couple of, you know, few run-ins with the referee. I'm still, I'm still not sure I'm a huge, I'm still not sure I'm a huge fan of watching him play. Like some of the foul baiting stuff, especially when he played us, uh, I just, I'm not the biggest, biggest fan of him necessarily, but he is an incredibly talented player. Even with Kyrie there, he's still going to get the ball in his hands probably more than any other player in the league, arguably. Uh, I think there's certainly improvements in his game. I think, I don't know if I spoke about it with you before or, or sometime on a different, uh, on a uh, earlier podcast about the defensive end of the floor. Like, could he just improve 10% defensively? And I think that could not only help his case for MVP, but more importantly, you know, push the Mavericks up to a top five or six seed, which when we're talking about MVP, you, you've really got to be on at least a top six seed, maybe even a top four seed. And for me, the Mavericks are the team that are going to take the big uh, lift here in the Western Conference from being 11 seed to, I think when we did our predictions, I had them fifth, I think. And it wouldn't surprise me if they're top four. So if that's the case, uh, Luke is obviously going to have to play incredibly well to get them to that point. And I think it is a realistic uh, chance for them to be able to do that. And for him, uh, with the way he's looking at the moment, um, fit, as I said, should be really motivated after you know an horrific season for the Mavericks last season. You know him at seven dollars would be my favorite. I think second on the line, I've just got I think Jokic and Giannis. I think they're the consensus two best players in the world, and I don't believe it's particularly close. Like I think there's a bit yeah. of a gap between those two players and the rest. So I think you've got to have them um, somewhere, I suppose, given they're just the two best players in the league. And then my Smokey, which is, again, a little bit of a piss take maybe along the lines of the Simmons ones. It's, it's ironic because he's also $76, as Simmons was in the uh, uh, six-man-of-the-year market. Kawhi? Wow. Landed. Wow. He can't <laughs> rest. He cannot rest without the Clippers having to fork out money for fines now. He will not be allowed. Is there any chance here that he plays 65-plus games? I just want to – now, can we just talk about the Suns against the Clippers in the first round of the playoffs? So Kawhi played the first two games, right, and then got injured. You know, who? jeez, who would have thought he got injured? What a surprise. Yeah, what a shock. And I don't know why I'm even mentioning him in the MVP calculations right now uh, because of that. He looked. Like, he was a better player than Kevin Durant and Devin Booker in the first two games. Correct. He just was, and that Kawhi Leonard looked like one of the best players on the planet again, like he did in 2019. Now, if you extrapolate that two game span out to an 82 game season, we have an MVP caliber player, ladies and gentlemen. We really do. Now, it's very unlikely that, that happens, but he put up. Just I was looking back at his stats in those just I know it's two games, but thirty four and a half points, six and a half rebounds, six assists, sixty percent three point shooting over ten attempts. So he was six of ten over the two games. Looked I still think this guy, like if I'm coming up against him in the playoffs, he still scares the shit out of me. And he hasn't really been anywhere consistently great since twenty nineteen. But I don't know. This is. <laughs> I just. I don't know. There's, there's got to be no faith in him playing more than fifty games, let alone sixty-five games. But as as I said, he won't be actually allowed to. Like he's not thirty-five yet. He's not exempt from the back-to-back uh, things. He won't be allowed to rest without Steve Ballmer having to get in his back pocket and forking out serious money. So, is there a chance that he actually plays a lot more than he has previously? Or I suppose the thing is, like, he'll just get injured at some point and miss 30 games regardless of the resting. So we'll wait and see. Uh, The Clippers, I think, are in a little bit of trouble if he doesn't play consistently well as well. Like, if the Clippers don't make, you know, we spoke about this on our um, Western Conference preview episode. If the Clippers don't make the playoffs this season, I wouldn't be shocked. And therefore, I actually think Kawhi needs to play at certainly an all-NBA level and play 60-plus games to kind of guarantee them uh, a seeding, you know, in the top seven or eight, uh, let alone hopefully for their sake going out of the uh, the playing tournament and hopefully getting a top six seed. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting for me. I just wanted to, to mention his name because 
I just I think back to those that those first couple of games in the first round of the playoffs and think that guy looked like one of the top five players in the league. He did. Now again, two game span, but he was coming up against KD and Booker, and he's looked like you know that he was without Paul George. He looked like he was single handedly going to push the Phoenix Suns and potentially eliminate them from the first round of the playoffs. Just wanted to mention it. Mm. Yeah, uh, I probably won't put any money on him for MVP, but I, oh, I no, agree I along. <laughs> the, what you're I guess, hoping, I hope I understood this correctly, alluding to them putting their foot down essentially with him, like he has to play because some of the mm. fines, I think, they can be, I think there's like a three-strike warning, but one of them is like close to like a million dollars a year to pay on the second or third strike. They're like, first of all, no owner wants to keep paying that sort of money. Mm. And secondly, their stadium opens up next year or year after yeah. and they're going to need stars to fill those it's a lot of money that pumped to that stadium you'd want to kind of explode with the stars power and everything like that and if your two stars aren't like there full stop and what you're rolling out with i mean russ is exciting but he's he'll be probably close to the 34 by the time that eventually comes around i mean terrence man is like like that's all you're really rolling out there. That's not going to sell tickets at all. So mm. I think they're going to put their foot down in some sort of format uh, this year because as rich as Steve Ballmer is and the, how deep his pockets go, he's a businessman at the end of the day. And I don't think you have to be, be a billionaire or a businessman to know uh, what sells and what doesn't. So um, that's going to be an interesting – that's just going to be an interesting watch, I reckon. With, mm. If they have a repeat of the past four years, so, something's going to crack down. But, but yeah. what you said about uh, Tatum and Luca. I think so. I think every young player kind of goes through this kind of. A, I feel like I've seen the same cycle because Devin Booker and Tatum, I felt like had almost selfish shot chucker reputations around the league when they're a little bit younger, weren't really playing winning basketball, just putting up kind of huge numbers, and they kind of fixed it out. Like they become a bit more defensive. They have picked up their playmaking and stuff like that. And I feel I feel like Luke is kind of going through that start. That I mean, he's still incredibly young. We mm. can't forget that his play style. It is, I guess, it comes across selfish and foul baiting and stuff. So I think he's still figuring out that and eventually he'll, he'll kind of even out. But I just feel like with Tatum, he's gone through so many of those cycles. There was that shot chucker, ball hog kind of Tatum, and then he fixed that. Then the defender came out and the leader came out. And I just feel like this is the year kind of all balances out and uh, eventually comes out. So um, MVP is mm. always a weird one. There's storylines. I feel like the past, the last few weeks of each season, we were jumping back and forth between them beating Joker, and beating Joker, and beating Joker. Uh, and then there's the whole, oh, why do we wait till the postseason? Because then the MVP looks, like, MVP looks fraudulent now, almost, mm. with the way he came out, and then he was the MVP of the league. So another yeah. one that's incredibly tricky to try and uh, find as a, to any NBA fan. I mm. guys that talk about it as much as we do. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Booker there. I was actually tempted to put him in my top three at fifteen dollars as well. I I do think you know Chris Paul going out a little bit more playmaking responsibility there. I think he's you know points per game. You know even they might take a slight dip, but I think his assist numbers could go up. Uh, I think that you're probably going to see injuries to KD and Bradley Beal during the regular season, which may put his workload up, uh, put Booker's workload up even more. So he was another one. I just, I didn't mind that at $15. Anyway, we'll finish it up there. Uh, look, last question I have to ask you, who have you got here for the, the final four of the AFL? Who are you going for? Uh, well, the GWS last night. Oh, just geez, such a great you and group. everyone else. Man, I'll finally become a GWS man, a bandwagon lifelong fan of GWS. So, because uh, I, I feel like as a Bombers fan, I can't support Colton. I can't support Collingwood. Yeah. And Brisbane, they're just, a, I don't really think about Brisbane at all. So, yeah. I think it's just deleting um, all the other options with that one. Um, if Collingwood were to, God forbid, heaven forbid, Friday doesn't work. Would who would you who would you pick? Who would you uh, like? Yeah, I'm, I'm like I feel like GW. Like if you've got no dog in the fight, you're going for GWS. And mm. if your dog in the fight loses, you're going for GWS. Yeah, they 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 just I don't know they've got so much fanfare at the moment. A similar thing kind of happened in 2019 as well, where they had all this wave of momentum um, from outside the top four, made it through, and then just got demolished in the grand final. Obviously sure. by Richmond, uh, they've got their social. I don't know if, if you've seen stuff, much stuff from their social media team. Their social yeah. media team is by far the best in the AFL. It's not even close. Yeah. Some hilarious stuff going on there. Uh, I love. I'm a big Toby Green fan. I don't understand the, the hate for Toby Green. I think he's absolutely fantastic. You know, you have him any day. 
of the week. So, yeah, I think you've got to be going for the Giants if you're not a Collingwood, Colton or Brisbane fan. Uh, and if one of the, if you go for one of those teams and they get eliminated, I think you've got to go for GWS. Part of me wants a Collingwood, Colton grand final. Do you imagine? Oh, that'd be, I mean, mate, you being in Victoria for that week, that would be absolutely insane. You might, you might feel a few earth tremors if those two make the grand final, like no, no word of a lie. However, I also if if Collingwood were to lose to Colton in the grand final, I'm taking I'm going out of the country for the wow. next three months. Yeah, smart. yeah, smart. Yeah, I could not be around here. I feel like beating Colton in the grand final would be the absolute ultimate, absolutely fantastic. Losing to Colton would be the biggest nightmare in your life. Um, <laughs> I actually just to finish up the kind of AFL NBA crossover, I do have a, a good mate of mine who is a bigger, not a bigger, but as big, if not bigger. Uh, calling a fan as I am. But he also goes for the Nuggets. He's a big Nuggets fan in the NBA. Okay. And so he's going for the all-time double up, the Nuggets championship into the Pies premiership potentially. And that is the dream. I came close to it in 2018. Warriors won the the title and then oh, the Pies yes. lost by okay. four or five points in the grand final. So I was very, very close to it. Didn't, But that is the dream. The the championship NBA championship into uh into AFL Premiership that double in the same year would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think you as an Essendon fan, you you can probably steer clear and not have to yeah, worry about that dream too much. <laughs> yeah, double up the odds of that happening. Speaking of actually, speaking of mates of yours, I was at, I was at the pub last night and uh, I, was, I was talking to uh, Connor Flanagan, who's got a mate of his who's the strength and conditioning coach for the Brooklyn Nets. Actually, so I'd love to meet him and just ask him some stories. And uh, kind of about asked, <laughs> yeah, I do want to ask him about this. And he asked him, like, what's it like being a strength and conditioning coach? He's an Aussie as well, which is pretty impressive. Mm. What's it like there? And he goes, mate, I don't really do much strength and conditioning. Most of the t- stuff I do, I just get IV drips ready for the players because they go mm. out every night, get absolutely obliterated. And then he just has to set up IV drips for them to get ready for the for a game. So uh. a little bit of insight into the NBA players. And I mean, I guess 82 game season. And they can still go out every night and play yeah. that. It's um, it's no league quite like it. I don't reckon. Yeah, absolutely enjoying yourself. I tell you, like AFL players, if you get you know photoed at the pub, you know <laughs> a week before the game, you're uh, you're in a bit of trouble, and you're probably getting a couple of game suspension. Just the uh, the different cultures there is kind of wild. Anyway, we'll uh, finish it up there, mate. Enjoy uh, your week ahead. Much planned. Very quiet. I'll try and actually get games to this Friday's because game. I've got a couple of mates who are trying to get long sorted, so maybe I might be in attendance uh, going for the Giants. <laughs> get your orange beanie and your orange jumper on and whatever else. Anyway, thanks for joining me, mate. Uh, we'll catch up next time. Very good. See you, mate.